Hi, this is Rick Caesar from oculoplastics.info uh, covering the first of our basic tutorials and this is a practical approach to ectropion. So if you look at the pathological classification of ectropion, about 80% is going to be involutional and the cicatricial, paralytic and mechanical make up just the other 20%. So the Involutional is by far the most common. As you can see here, a right-sided ectropion, the punctum is everted and the tarsus is uh, partially revealed with this characteristic red lid rolled away from the eye. With a paralytic ectropion, the weight of the face is applied and you can see this extends as well to the weight of the forehead. Punctum is everted and the lower lid is pulled, not just rolled, but pulled away from the eye. So a paralytic ectropion nearly always significantly worse than an involutional. And here you see quite a marked medial ectropion. And this is, of course, a cicatricial ectropion, as you can tell from this scar here. And this scar means there's a shortage of anterior lamella, which is being pulled therefore away and the medial ectropion is quite dramatic. Uh, this unfortunate patient actually has a mechanical ectropion and you can see me outlining here a rather large mass, the weight and size of which was pushing the lid away from the eyeball and unfortunately this mass is in fact a metastasis and this just demonstrates the extent to which even something as simple as an ectropion uh, needs full examination. Now, the symptoms of ectropion are really very, very straightforward. Uh, there's a, a cosmetic component in that the eye is rolled away from the eye and it, and it looks sore. And then there's a functional element in that it feels sore, it's irritated, the eye's watering, there's a problem with the tear film, there's intermittent blurred vision. And therefore, there's a very uh, sensible subdivision, a, a practical classification of ectropion into cosmetic ectropion and functional. And this time, it's the other way around. Cosmetic ectropion is less common and functional ectropion makes up the majority. Again, a 20-80 split or around there. If we consider cosmetic ectropion, the key feature here is that the patients really are asymptomatic, of course, other than their appearance. And crucially, they don't complain about a watering eye. Uh, so the they're often sent in by their family because it's their friends and family who comment on them uh, about the positioning of their lower lid. And the chance of success here is very high, even if the ectropion is a full tarsal ectropion like this. So here you can see the tarsus is completely uh, inverted. It's upside down. Uh, the punctum is nowhere near the eye. And yet it's quite unusual patient presenting like this can in fact be completely comfortable. And the other curious thing about a tarsal ectropion is that the cornea is nearly always well protected and the eye is completely safe. This brings us really to the, a first caveat, which is sometimes a patient is quite elderly and it, the family are the people who are unhappy with the appearance of the eye but the patient is actually comfortable. So when you're going to examine an ectropion, it really is very straightforward. How much lid laxity is there? Is there anything cicatricial, mechanical or paralytic that's effectively pulling it down? And then really, given that it's going to be your workhorse, is a lateral tarsal strip going to work or are there problems? When we consider all the different ways you can tighten the lower lid, the 
most important by far is going to be your lateral tarsal strip. This really is your lower lid tightening workhorse. A canthopexy is very useful, but it doesn't actually do much. It's not a very powerful technique. And all the other techniques will only represent a fraction of what you do. The canthopexy is really very, very elegant, but the amount of power it has is quite minimal. So the idea is you identify the orbital rim, you make a little stab incision above uh, the midline, and then you pass your suture from another little stab incision, take a bite of the inner aspect of the rim, and come out through the first stab incision. So the entire canthus is then tightened up on a proline suture. The workhorse, the tarsal strip, infinitely more powerful tool. Uh, in the tarsal strip, we fashion a completely denuded portion of the lateral tarsus, identify the orbital rim, and suture this denuded tarsus to the inner aspect of the rim uh, with a, a 5 proline or a 5 vicral. This is a, a, a very impressive technique. You can, of course, shorten the lid rather than by pulling outwards. You can shorten a lid by pulling inwards. And a traditional pentagonal wedge placed in the lateral third uh, will shorten a lid very effectively. It's nothing like as popular now as uh, the lateral pull from a tarsal strip, but it's still very effective. A modification of this, which does have a place in ectropin repair, is the skin sparing wedge. And th this is really very straightforward. A, a subciliary incision is made, and the lateral two-thirds pentagonal wedge is simply taken out uh, underneath uh, the lifted skin and orbicularis. And what effectively means this means is that you're taking a, uh, a horizontally orientated block of tissue and by pulling it together you make it a more vertically orientated block of tissue. And of course the area from the first has to be equal to the area of the second and this provides a very modest but nonetheless, it provides a little bit of lift. The lazy T is a beautifully named technique, um, but again, not, not so often used. And the idea here is that if you have a medial ectropion, you can actually place your uh, pentagonal excision in the medial third and combine it with a medial spindle. So why is this a lazy T? Well, once you've sewn it all up, the, uh, the wedge gives you a, a vertical line and the medial spindle is going to give you a horizontal line. And these, these two lines, when taken together, ah, can be considered to be a letter T uh, lying on its side, therefore lazy. Um, it's a lovely name, but unfortunately I don't think it's such a great technique. Uh, there is interest now in uh, Bix technique, but before we come to that, we're going to look at their KZ. And this is uh, much less used in uh, ectropion. Uh, but is essentially a combination of, uh, rather than a skin sparing uh, protected lateral wedge, it's a lateral wedge in combination with a lower lid blepharoplasty skin excision. Uh, again, it has its places, but it's not that popular. Bix technique, however, may be having a little bit of a resurgence. So the idea of Bix is it's a very simple, rather than a pentagon, it's a straightforward lateral triangle. Now, 
The reason people are interested in Bix is that the scar hides very well, and because no part of the tarsal plate is reburied, none of the meibomian uh, glands are, are buried, and therefore the risk of granuloma is reduced. One concept is to double fasten this and combine it with a canthopexy. So a little stab incision is made by the orbital rim and the suture goes from the tarsal plate to the lateral canthus and then out through the rim. And this may in fact have a double advantage of a canthal tightening as well as the lid shortening. When we look now therefore at photos of uh, canthopexy, you kick off with a straightforward stab incision based on the lateral extent of the upper lid skin crease. And this is a quite a small incision. Second stab incision is made just on the canthus and the suture is passed to the inner aspect of the rim. And the suture is passed in two arms the two arms are then knotted carefully with a number of knots and the knots passed to bury nice and deep in the wound. And if you leave the needles on, you can then make sure the knots stay deep and that the ends of the suture are also nicely buried by passing the needle back into the stab incision and out laterally. The lateral tarsal strip, our workhorse, the most important thing is, surgically is to expose the rim. Every time I see anybody find this operation difficult, it's because they haven't taken time to fully expose the orbital rim, and so placing their suture is not as easy as it should be. The decision-making in lateral tarsal strip is really how much do you want to shorten the lid? How large a tarsal strip are you going to make? Once you've decided, the pass of each of the arms of the suture is to the inner aspect of the orbital rim. As you close, there's often a, a little triangle of skin to trim off, but interestingly, quite often there isn't, or it's actually smaller than shown here. In terms of the effect, the lateral tarsal strip is a wonderful technique. Here you see a not too badly placed punctum, uh, but quite a marked lateral ectropion. And after a tarsal strip, the lid really is back where it should be, up against the globe with the punctum in excellent position. Now, the tarsal strip does have some problems when faced with maxillary hyperplasia. This clothes lining means that the eyelid can pull underneath the eye. So when you have someone with this hemiproptosis and negative vector, uh, beware. Now this will become evident at your preoperative examination because when you simply place your thumb gently on the lid and pull laterally, you'll notice that instead of lifting, the eyelid is drawn underneath the eyeball. Uh, this uh, means you're going to have to modify your technique. So what are your two options if there's a hemiproptosis? The first is to take what might have been the position of your tarsal strip and uh, elevate it, rotate it to make it uh, a significantly more superior insertion onto the orbital rim. And the second option, and one that's not bad at all in my opinion, is to do a skin sparing uh, pentagonal wedge. Uh, this gives this slight upwards uh, uh, lift to the tissues and this can help. So when we consider functional ectropion, the whole point is the patient is suffering with a watery eye and this is difficult to resolve because tear film issues are involved. And inevitably, anything to do with the tear film isn't just usually multifactorial, it's 
always multifactorial. So compared to cosmetic ectropion, functional ectropion is much, much harder to treat. Here you can see a classic involutional ectropion, the punctum zeverted, and you can imagine the lacrimal gland is carefully producing some lovely tears to help that eye, but because the position of the lower lid is where it is, where can the tears go but over the edge? So a component of the repair has to be uh, tightening the lower lid, but additional procedures are often necessary. You might need to enlarge the punctum with a three-snip punctoplasty, tighten the retractors to get the lid in the better position, and if there's a cicatricial element, you're going to need to add tissue, either with a flap or with a full thickness skin graft. As an add-on, the three-snip punctoplasty is going to be your most used technique. Here you have one, two, and three snips. And what you're aiming to do with those one, two, and three snips is a posterior ampullectomy. So where the punctum, and often quite small punctum, needs to be enlarged is in a posterior direction. And by removing the full uh, inner surface of the ampulla, you should get the double benefit of a larger punctum, but also the punctum aimed in a better direction. And so a posterior ampullectomy is what you're trying to achieve with your three snip. Now, something to beware. You really should check lacrimal patency in clinic. You do not want to do a three snip prior to syringing and then discover there's in fact a nasolacrimal duct blockage. Because if you put silicon tubes in, they can cheese wire. So here's a patient with a very subtle punctal eversion. There's quite a mild ectropion and so you could combine a three snip with a canthopexy, possibly, rather than a full tarsal strip. Now the canthopexy is not a particularly powerful technique. So what kind of results will you get? Well, slight. So as it happens, the three snip has done its job. The punctum is in a better position, but the overall lift generated by the canthopexy isn't particularly spectacular. So while canthopexy has a place, I think the power of the tarsal strip means that in most circumstances you're going to prefer that. Here you see a slightly more prominent ectropion. Punctum is small and everted and definitely needs a three snip together with the power of a full lateral tarsal strip. Now the other option you have in this situation is adding a medial spindle which we'll come to shortly. But the key thing here is this lower lid needs to be lifted back up against the eye and inverted and that can all be achieved by means of the three snip and the tarsal strip. So with the punctum in a better position, there is the chance of the functional epiphora, epiphora being improved. And the scar from the tarsal strip really is very, very minimal. Now, it's important to understand how you can do a retract application with the spiral suture, otherwise known as the medial spindle when placed medially. This is a really, really useful technique. And for ectropion, you spiral this suture down. Now this is pre-drawn to save me a bit of time. So if you're going to do a spiral suture for ectropion, the first thing you do is make a small stab incision through the skin and just into the orbicularis. Uh, and this is at the level of the orbital rim. Step two is 
to go onto the conjunctival side and either make a vertical excision from the base of the tarsus downwards or make a little diamond excision of conjunctiva to reveal the lower lid retractors. And you're going to pass your double armed suture, you're going to pick up the lower lid retractors and then you're going to move through to step three. Once you've picked up the retractors, you're going to move through to pick up the base of the tarsal plate. So step one, you've made a stab. Step two, you're on the conjunctival side, you've picked up your retractors. In step three, you've taken that double armed suture and picked up the base of the tarsal plate. And then step four is to spiral out and down. And this direction of pull then takes the retractors to the tarsus and the tarsus uh, back towards the globe. And of course you pass your sutures down and out and through your stab incision. When you're looking at it in the, the classic diagrammatic technique, looking at it from the front, you therefore can imagine that the lower lid really is hanging off. There's your everted punctum. And so you, first of all, feel for where the orbital rim is and make a small stab incision at the rim. Then you go to the inner aspect of the lower lid and take out a diamond uh, just inferior to the punctum, you identify your lower lid retractors, you identify the base of your tarsal plate, and your suture then passes from the lower lid retractors as your first bite through tarsal plate, and then in a spiral back in, round and out. Now you can repeat this it doesn't just have to be medially, it can be centrally and laterally, so you can repeat it all the way along. And so when you're presented with a patient who has really quite impressive tarsal ectropion, combined with a brow ptosis and a, a, a full a ptosis ptosis, so clearly here the aim is to uh, take that tarsal ectropion and completely uh, turn it over so it's back up against the eye and at the same time you're going to need to uh, lift the, the upper lid and really all the tissues here could do with being elevated. Gravity is a powerful thing especially over 90 years but you can lift it all back up and here despite doing some uh, blepharoplasty we didn't do enough and there's this residual dermatocalasis uh, that I think could certainly do with a trim. However, the upper lid is in a much better position and the lower lid is really in a significantly better position up against the eye. And most pleasingly of all, the punctum is back in a position. However, the causes of epiphora are multifactorial so even if you get your lower lid right back into position, the eye may still water. Now, if there's an inadequate amount of tissue in your anterior lamella and you have a cicatricial ectropion, then this is going to pull the eyelid away from the globe and you're clearly going to need to use a spacer graft. And for this patient, we use some preauricular skin how much should you replace? I find that if I make my graft normally about twice the size I think I'll need to put the lid back into the correct position, that allows for enough post-operative shrinkage and it puts the lid in the best position. Another really useful technique is the heteropalpable flap, which probably is worth an entire tutorial 
of its own. However, on a simplistic level, the tarsal strip is fashioned, making the incision slightly more horizontal than downward sloping. And a long finger flap is hinged from the end of the tarsal incision, following the upper lid skin crease and tapering down at the uh, to the point reaching the upper punctum. And then a second subsiliary incision is made uh, from the punctum along the lower lid. And this upper heteropalpebral flap can then be lifted and dissected carefully to give uh, a good deep uh, amount of orbicularis at the lateral third, which gives an excellent blood supply as it's lifted and rotated into position. So to imagine it in position, it's fairly straightforward. There's a, a twist and a movement and the more vertically positioned base of the flap moves uh, to be slightly infer inferiorly positioned, but still giving a significant amount of lift. And this is, this is one of the reasons why this works so well as a technique. And obviously, once you sew up, you have a lovely invisible, or hopefully invisible scar in the upper lid, lid crease and a nicely uh, positioned and well uh, vascularized flap uh, providing extra tissue uh, into the lower lid. And it's that, it's that fantastic blood supply from the orbicularis uh, that means that this flap tends to uh, heal better than a full thickness skin graft. In summary, what are the options for a minimal ectropion? Well, if there's a mechanical problem, remove the weight. If there's a mild cicatricial ectropion, it's nearly always going to be from uh, offending glaucoma drops and intense topical steroids and emollients can help. And if there is mild laxity, you could consider a canthopexy, but a small tarsal strip is almost certainly going to be better. Once you're considering a moderate ectropion, then if there is a, a, a facial nerve palsy with a paralytic ectropion, you're going to need a large tarsal strip and you always want to consider anchoring that tarsal strip a little bit more superiorly than you would for a non-paralytic ectropion. If there's uh, tight skin, you could consider a wedge, but a heteropalpebral flap would be better or a full thickness skin graft. But the lateral tarsal strip is such a workhorse, it's likely to remain a favorite for some time. Options for functional ectropion. Well, you're going to need to tighten the lower lid and then you're going to need to add extra components. The three snip punctoplasty is a workhorse. The medial spindle is a fantastic technique, adding tissue when required. And then of course, don't forget your emollients, your lubricant drops, your heat and your lid hygiene. Thank you.